Well, hello, my family. Love you guys so, so much. You picked a great Sunday to tune in. We're thrilled that all of you are with us, uh, whether you are watching this on a Sunday or on a Tuesday or on a Saturday night before you go to the club. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, we're gonna help keep, keep you pointed the right direction before you go out and party. And maybe when you go out, you're just not gonna do as much crazy stuff as you would have normally done because you had the chance to open up God's word and allow the grace of God to grab a hold of your heart. Honestly, I'm, I'm excited about today. And I really think God has something significant in store for all of us. Uh, we've been praying about this moment, been praying uh, about this series that we've been in. Uh, we just started it, this is week number two two of the quilt series, Spiritual Direction for the Soul of Our Church. Uh, I don't know about you, but this world seems like it's turning uh, uh, upside down, and I feel a mandate to help it get right side up. Uh, again, I, I'm not a politician. I'm a pastor. Uh, that means I'm not in this thing to get another term. I'm not in this thing so that people like me. I'm not in this thing for approval ratings. Uh, God's the one that said, Earl, I need you to do this. Earl, I need you to step up and be my hands and feet in your generation. And then uh, he's given me the honor to serve all of you and to help you become who God has called you to be. So as I'm this spiritual guide, if you will, helping us to be conformed to the image of Christ, not to our own image, not to the image of this world, but to the image of Jesus Christ. So we're about Jesus. We're about this autobiography uh, that God wrote here uh, through mankind. And, and we are about lifting up the name of Jesus. And Jesus has, as he's lifted up, He's going to draw men and women unto himself. Uh, why, why do we call it the quilt series? Uh, a, a quilt is a bunch of different pieces that are, that are stitched together, thus the, the sto sewing machines that are around me. And, and a quilt has this ability uh, to, to just make you, make you feel warm and, and covered and we, we, we sense right now with all that's going on in our world, the anxiety and the depression and, and suicide is at an all-time high. And individuals are wrestling with so many things internally and, and, and the stress that can be on people's brains. We, we sense that the peace of God is necessary in this moment. But how will we get there? Will we get there by pointing fingers? Will we get there by tearing each other down? Will we get there uh, by stabbing each other in the back? We say no. We'll get there by by lifting up the, the Jesus of Scripture, not some manufactured Jesus, not some Jesus that we try to uh, pick and choose the parts of him that we love, but the Jesus of Scripture is one that is powerful and mighty and has the power to make that which is wrong right. Uh, the title of today's message is One Isn't the Loneliest Number. One isn't the loneliest number. So all of you single people, go ahead and text your parents right now. Tell them to stop asking you when you're going to get married because one isn't the loneliest number. A quick recap from last week when we were together. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. Some of you may remember this. Uh, this is when Jesus went to Caesarea Philippi with his disciples and he asks them a question and uh, Peter ends up speaking up. You're the Christ. The, you're, you're the one that we've been waiting for. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, man, I'm telling you, Peter, flesh and blood didn't tell you this. God himself had to tell you this. And on this rock, Peter, I'm gonna build my church and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overcome it. You may remember, we looked at, we grabbed the jaws of life last week, and we had these jaws of life. Speaking of the jaws of life, we have someone who's a part of our Shoreline City family, one person I'm thinking of right now, Jason Sherman, who we love so much. Matter of fact, Jason's probably behind the camera right now. Love you, Jason. Uh, but Jason uh, and his wonderful wife were in a horrific accident a couple of years ago. Uh, they were rear-ended by an 18-wheeler. Honestly, he and his wife should not be here right now, but for the grace of God. But it was some jaws of life 
that went to them in that accident and, and ripped that door open. And we feel as a church, we've been called to be the ones to go into places where people are broken and have had accidents and help rip the doors open so they can get the freedom that they can, fi- that they can find in Jesus Christ. We are not on the defensive as a church. We are on the offensive. We are the ones that are moving forward. We're not the ones sitting back, whining, scared, fearful. No, we're, we're the first responders, church. We're the ones that when we hear the sirens, when we hear the cries, when we hear that individuals are going through certain things, when we hear of divorce or discord, when we hear of racism, when we hear of fear and depression, when we hear of abuse and neglect, when we hear of these things, we're not the ones that hide out in the corner. We're the jaws of life. We're the hands and feet of Jesus to go into those spots and say, hey, you're not going to be there forever. You will not be stuck there forever. You will not be chained there forever. And we can see these jaws of life opening up doors and opening up gates. I I pray after we're done here today, you feel like some, some gates or some chains that have been on you will get off of you. I'm praying that today you'll sense that the power of Almighty God is coming to your living room and coming to your phone or coming to you on your jog or on your bike ride. And you will sense the very presence and power of Almighty God setting you free from the things that have chained your mother or your father or your sister or your brother or you for generations. I'm praying that we would see freedom and hope and life because really, really, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake, my friends. Uh, Go go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 10. We looked at this verse real quick last week. Let Let me read it though. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with. Come on, listen. The weapons that we fight with. The weapons that the church fights with. Can I have weapons? Yes, you can have weapons. The church, the church has weapons. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish stronghold. Today, I'm going to talk about one of our greatest weapons. It's unity. Unity. Don't tune me out, okay? Don't, don't, don't cut off the video just yet. Don't turn off your Spotify. Don't, 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 don't do that right now. I, I need you. I need you to hear this because there's some profound implications to our unity, profound. And yes, there's implications for your family and there's implications for your personal life and there's implications for your marriage. There's even implications for your future marriage. Those of you who want to be married one day, there's implications for your business that you're running or the team that you're leading at work. There's implications in all of those areas. But my friends, there are implications for eternity. And this is something that is missed many times when we begin to talk about unity. Eternity is actually at stake. Now, this world we live in, you know this like I do, is about division. (laughs) It's about power. It's about money. It's about like me and mine. That's what this world is about. But when you and I become followers of Jesus Christ, we now are connected to something a whole lot bigger than me. We're connected to something a whole lot bigger than the individual. We are connected to something that's a whole lot bigger than just me on my own island getting me and mine and taking care of my family. We are now connected to something that is so much bigger than me, but can only be accomplished with we. You got to have a team. The NBA is back, okay? And I'm excited about the NBA being back. I love basketball. Uh, with the NBA being back, uh, you've got, of course, LeBron James. You've got James Harden. You've got, uh, well, not Steph Curry. Steph Curry's team did not make it uh, back. But, but with, with the NBA being back, You and I need to understand it's going to be phenomenal. And you've got LeBron James and you've got Giannis. You've got all these players. But in the NBA, they don't play one verse five. 
They play five verse five. Why do they play five verse five? It's because you need five capable players against another five capable players. Now, if I were to say LeBron James is going to take on all by himself five other NBA players, there is no way he would win. He just wouldn't. He's not good enough to beat, be one player that beats five players. He's just not good enough to do that. Matter of fact, he can't even pass the ball into himself. Thinking about uh, one verse five, I, I think like me versus my wife and like maybe four of her friends, I honestly think I would win. I honestly think I would win. Now, my wife is athletic. She's strong. She's capable. She could, without a doubt, uh, at least score a bucket. But I think, I think I would win. I think one verse five, me against uh, my middle son or definitely against L, our daughter, hands down, I'm going to win. I don't think I would win one verse five with my, my oldest son who's 15. He's just gotten too strong and too good. Parker, that's a shout out for you because last week I threw you under the bus. But one verse five in the NBA, it's just not happening. It, it, it's just, the, the level is too high. Can I just tell you, that right now, where we are as a nation, as a world, it's too high a level for it to be one verse five. We need everyone coming together, everyone on the team, everyone on the court being willing to give our best because we have a demonic stronghold that is trying to come against our nation and our world. And I dare I say even trying to come into the church and tear us apart. But what we need right now is we need the church to come together and to be one team. Look, look with me in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse number 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now here is Jesus praying a prayer. This is really the Lord's prayer, if you will. This is Jesus praying. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. How powerful is that? That they may be one as we are one. I in them, in you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me. And I've loved them even as you have loved me. I uh, went to go get a bike uh, not too long ago, you know, trying to stay in a little bit of shape. Uh, my wife is doing all of her online workouts, and I'm just trying to, you know, make sure people, when they look at us, don't think, you know, I don't know, she doesn't belong with me. So I'm trying to do any little thing I can to be like, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm, I know I'm way out of her league, but I'm trying to stay a little bit close. So I was like, let me get a bike. Uh, she got me all the, 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 some stuff for the gym. So I'm, I'm just trying to stay in a little bit of shape. I go, I go get my bike. I put my mask on. I head to REI. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but bikes are expensive, incredibly expensive. I, I mean, by expensive, I'm, I'm not just talking $200 expensive. I'm talking like $2,500 expensive. Uh, so I'm not getting a $2,500 bike. I'm going in there just trying to get a couple hundred dollars, a few hundred dollar bike uh, so I can ride around White Rock Lake that we have here in Dallas. It's not too far from our home. So I go in, I get my bike. And I'm checking out, and a guy is walking up to me. Now, I have my mask on, you know, trying to be a, a respectful citizen. You can't even get into a, a store in Dallas without having your mask on. So I've got my mask on. Someone else is walking up to me. Another employee walks up with his uh, mask on. He says, hey, are you the pastor of that really large church? And I go, well, I don't know if I am the pastor of a large church, but I'm a pastor of a loving church. And we start uh, talking, come to find out he and his wife had visited the church. And the reason they visited is one Sunday morning around oh, what, 10, 30, 11 o'clock or so, he was driving past our White Rock campus and he saw droves of people walking across the street, droves of people. 
they're walking to the parking lot that we have across the street at our White Rock uh, campus. Those of you who remember when we were meeting together uh, at, at the White Rock campus, you, you know that, that trek across the street. We got our, our police officers there helping us across. And, and he saw all these people leaving the church, going to the parking lot, and they're smiling from ear to ear. They're happy. And not only are they happy, there are people from all different walks of life. I mean, there's black people, there's white people, there's Asian people, there's Latinos, uh, there's older people, there's younger people, there's people with their kids, there's people that have no kids, there's people that are really stylish, and there's people that don't even care what they wear. There were all these people coming together, and they're all walking across the street smiling. He saw that, and he said, okay, I need to figure out a way to get to that place because I have not seen a church that is that happy and looks like heaven on earth. It was the beauty of our diversity and the joy with which we were living that made this man say, I've got to bring my family to that church. This, my friends, is the, a mandate that is on our house. You, you see in, in John uh, chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus is praying this prayer and it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing prayer. And he says, I'm not just praying for that time. I'm also praying for a time that's yet to come. It's like Jesus saying, I'm not just praying for the disciples of, 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 of that day. I'm also praying for the disciples of this day. I'm not just praying for the disciples that are following me right now. I'm praying for the disciples that are going to believe in me through their message. So now Jesus is praying for me and he's praying for you. And he's praying that all of us in verse 21, that we would be one. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you this. In, uh, in John, and not in John, but in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It talks about how man and woman, they come together and they're one flesh. One flesh. Then in Genesis chapter, chapter uh, 3, something terrible happens. The fall of mankind. And this fall happens. And when it does, God shows up on the scene and he's like, hey, Adam, what happened? And Adam, this is classic. This is a classic guy move. Hey, the woman you gave me, she's the reason everything's messed up. God goes to the woman and says, hey, what happened? She goes, oh, no, 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 don't look at me. It was a serpent. So each person is blaming someone else. Can I just tell you this? As long as we are pointing fingers, we aren't linking arms. And right now in our day and age, there is so much finger pointing going on, but we were not called to point the finger. We were called to link arms. We were called to be one. Jesus says, I'm going to pray this prayer to almighty God. And I believe Jesus is asking us to pray the same prayer and live the same prayer that you and I would be one as he and the father are one. I, I want to keep breaking down this passage of scripture. Go with me again to John 17, verse 21. That all that may be one, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, now watch this, so that, so that, why does he want us to be one? Why does he want us to be one? If you have kids, like I have kids, you, you've gotten this question 150 million times. Why? Why, 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 why? Jesus is praying that we would be one. So that, this is good, y'all. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Why do I want them to be one? So that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 23. I and them and you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. Then, when they're brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is what our unity is able to do. Our unity is able to let the world know that Jesus is who he says he is. And then our unity has the power, 
to let the world know they are loved by God, just like Jesus is loved by God. Do you have any friends that don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Do you have any friends that are struggling with whether or not God loves them? Do you have any? I submit this to you. The disunity of the church has distorted the message of the cross. Why are people not believing? Why are people not understanding the love of God? It's because of the church. Now, what church people like to do is we like to blame the world. Oh, the world is evil. Do you see what they're doing there? Do you see what they're doing here? Do you see what the media is doing there? Do you see what the right-wing media is doing? Do you see what the left-wing media is doing? And what the church likes to do is likes to look at the world. Oh, do you, can you believe that the world is acting like this? Let me just tell you, announcement. People who don't follow Jesus act like people who don't follow Jesus. My concern is not with those who don't follow Jesus. My concern is those who say they follow Jesus but still act like they don't follow Jesus. That, my friends, is a bigger issue, and that is the reason the world isn't believing that Jesus has been sent by God, and they don't understand the love of God for their lives. It's the disunity in the church. Feeling better? <laughs> I know it's easy to blame the big bad world, Oh, I know it's easy to blame big business or the right or the left or the middle or the up or the down. It's easy to blame everybody out there. And yes, there are some policies that need to change and there's some stuff that needs to happen in the world. Don't get me wrong. But that's not my mandate. My mandate is not to try to destroy division in the world. I feel compelled to destroy division in the church. My mandate is not to destroy racism in the world. My mandate is to try to destroy racism in the church. My mandate is not to try to destroy sexism and all the separation in the world. My friends, I feel like judgment starts in the house of God. And I think God is saying, if my church would get it, no wonder the world look how the world looks when the church looks how it looks. Here, here's, here's my concern. Here's my concern. I'm going to concern in a prayer. My concern is right now there is surface level friendship and deep rooted division. That's my concern. Surface level friendship. Hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. Oh, how you? Oh, I'm blessed. Okay, how you? Oh, you good? How are your kids? Okay, my kids are great. How are your kids? Okay, they're wonderful. What are you doing with school? I don't know what we're going to do with school. I might send my kids back, but I might not send my kids back, but I have to send them back because I got to go to work. What are you? Okay. <laughs> And we're good there. Might have been standing at the door whenever we're standing at doors again at Shoreline City. Can't wait. I'll give an update later this week about when we'll be uh, meeting again or gathering again. But can maybe even stand at the door with someone that looks different from a different side of the tracks, welcoming people into the house of God. Surface level friendship, deep rooted division. I had to talk to our staff about this because our staff is made up of people from all over. I mean, the Lord knew what he was doing <laughs> when he brought this staff together because it is not just one size fits all staff at all. I love them too. I love them. It's a beautiful family. But my concern, even on the staff team, was that there was surface level friendship and deep rooted division. But my prayer is that there would be deep-rooted friendship and surface-level division. 
That's what I think God is calling us to. So the disciples, um, can I give you a little history lesson for just a second? Okay. The disciples um, of Jesus' day were much more fascinating than most of us even realize. Let, let me give you a little bit of history for just a second. Um, this area where, where the Jews were living, about mm, 60 years or so before Jesus was born, it was, it was occupied. It was taken over by Rome. Rome came in and said, hey, we're taking charge of this. And they were essentially oppressing a people. Rome came in, took charge of the land. So imagine your neighborhood. Imagine your country. Imagine your people. And an outside entity, an outside government comes in and says, we're going to rule you. When Rome gets there and begins to rule over the Jews, they then, they then split them up into five areas, five administrations. And that's why there were different Roman governors. Rome then put five governors over these five different areas. Why did they divide them? It was one of the first things they did. They divided them up into five so that there would not be political power. There would not be any revolts. They would be able to suppress because if they could divide all the people, then the people would not be unified to begin to move forward and and take back their land. Okay? I'm talking about the, the context of Scripture. Four to eight years before Jesus is born, about four to eight years before Christ comes into the earth, one of the Herods dies, because you read the Bible, it's like Herod, and then there's another Herod, so, you know, they didn't name their kids like Elon Musk, you know, like 498XYWZ, they, they didn't do that. Uh, so, so Herod, one Herod dies, his son Herod is coming in uh, to power. The Jews saw this as an opportunity. They were like, man, the Messiah could be at hand. Let's go ahead and revolt. When they begin their revolt, 4,000 Roman soldiers descend on the area to squash the revolt. 2,000 Jews are crucified. This is four to eight years before Jesus is born. 2,000 Jews are crucified. Put on those trees. Hung there. And it's Rome announcing, if you ever try this again, we'll kill you. And then, I bring you good news of great joy for all the people in the town of David. A Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. Jesus comes on the scene. He's 30 years old. And he's getting his crew together. He's picking his 12 disciples. You don't think... People in that day and age remembered the 2,000 that were crucified? You don't think they remembered the pain and the agony that they've been walking through as a people? Do, Do you think that all of that was just erased from their memory? This is why when you read in the Bible, different things like uh, this Roman centurion came up to Jesus and said these nice things. It's kind of shocking because Rome and the Jews were not getting along because Rome had occupied their land. So let me tell you, I'm just going to pick two. I could pick more. I'm going to tell you two of the disciples that Jesus picked. One, Simon the Zealot. And another, Matthew the tax collector. Now, you and I read that. We're like, oh, okay, Simon the Zealot. Maybe this is his last name. Matthew the tax collector. Oh, I guess that was was his job. That's because we don't understand the context. You know what the Zealots were? They were nationalists. They were individuals that said, this is our land. These Roman scum, get them out. They're nasty. They're dirty. I can't stand them. And the, and the zealots, they not only did good things for the community, but they were the ones packing a little something, something. 
They were the ones that were willing to revolt. They were the ones that were trying to figure out, hey, how, how, can we, how can we use our power? How can we use our weapons? How can we usurp the authority of these people that have overtaken us? They were militant. Come on, I'm trying to make us uncomfortable for just a second. I want, I, I want you to feel this. I want you to feel this. They are against Rome. You would be too. If you were a Jew in that day, you'd be against them too. So now you've got Simon the Zealot and Jesus says, come follow me. You wouldn't pick him. Or some of you are like, oh, yes, I would. Yes, I would. That, that's exactly who I would pick. You know who else Jesus picked? Matthew, the tax collector. You know what the tax collectors did? They worked for the oppressor. They actually got their pay from this occupying nation. They worked on behalf of Rome to tax the Jewish people. And many times they were taking a cut for themselves. So that's why when you read through the Bible, he hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. The tax collectors get like a whole category all by themselves because to the Jews, they were sellouts. And Jesus picks a militant person in Simon the Zealot and picks what Simon the Zealot would call a sellout to be in his original 12. I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just, I'm just trying to help you for a second here. I'm trying to give you some context because our world right now is trying to tell us that everyone has to be one particular way in order for them to be followers of Jesus. Our world is trying to tell us that you have to believe just this one certain thing in order to be a follower of Jesus. But Jesus, he went and messed this up for all of us. He brought in, let me see for black, let me give you a black, people, black, black person example. He brought in, I wanted to make you uncomfortable too. I'm, I'm thinking one, uh, he brought in a black panther and an Uncle Tom. He said, follow me. And in John 17, he prayed that they be brought to complete unity. Let, let me make it a little more uncomfortable. This is just a little bit uncomfortable. Next week's gonna be even more. I can't, I can't wait for next week, okay? This is light compared to next week. Um, he grabs someone that will defend the flag no matter what. Someone that served in our armed forces. And he grabs someone that is marching and protesting in Black Lives Matter protest. Come follow me. Do you see how our world is trying to pull people apart? And Jesus here says, come here, zealot. Come here, tax collector. God, may they be one as I am in you and you are in me. May they be brought to complete unity so that the world may believe that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I'm not even concerned about the world right now. I, I got prayers I'm praying and of course my heart is heavy for our world, it is. But my mandate is for the church. Can I give you some truths real quick? There's some practical truths to, to go along with this. Num number one, you can write this down. We don't have to have the same politics to have the same purpose. We don't have to have the same politics to have the same purpose. Simon the Zealot and Matthew the Tax Collector had different politics. But they had the same purpose. Jesus and making it on earth as it is in heaven and sharing his message with the world. Do you know 
Jesus did not say, they will know you're my disciples by your political party. I got to smile when I say that because some of y'all, I'm like, whoa, wait, what, what, what? You mean a Republican? You mean a Democrat? You mean a liberal? You mean a... Jesus did not say, they will know you are my disciples by your political affiliation. He did not say, they will know you are my disciples by your hashtags. He did not say, they will know you are my disciples by your tattoos or your tithing or the way you dress or your marital status. He did not say, they will know you are my disciples based on the type of Bible that you read. He said, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for each other. And the demons of this day are trying to finagle their way, dare I say force their way into the church. Maybe even sadly, sometimes don't have to force their way because pride and religious spirits are allowed to permeate the church. So we can think we're justified. Oh, there are some non-negotiables. Do not get me wrong. There are some things that we all have to agree on. Don't get me wrong. But in our day and age, there's a whole lot of junk that you and I are getting wrapped up in that is not kingdom business. And many of us are hurting our reputation with the world because of the way we're treating each other. Okay, let me tell you this one. Unity is messy. Messy. If we all think we all just get to, all of a sudden, we're unified. Oh, we all just love Jesus. We all get to come together. It's like, oh, it's kumbaya and it's nice and chill and easy. Nope, it's messy. It's messy. Some of you, you got friendships right now and you've been friends for years. For years. And you have somebody that's not seeing things the way you see it. And you're saying, I can no longer be friends with you. And I get some of the hurt and the pain that's connected to the season. Trust me, I get it because I have felt it and been on the other side of it with people that I genuinely love and care about. And I hear what they say and it hurts. Okay? It hurts. And it's frustrating. And it is hard sometimes for people to discount your experience. That can hurt. But if I'm not going to shame someone that cheats on their spouse, I'm not going to shame someone that does not believe the way I want them to believe. If we're going to say, hey, hey, anybody is welcome at Shoreline City, except a Republican. Anybody is welcome at Shoreline City, except a Democrat. Anybody's welcome. You can come exactly how you are, but tell me how you believe. How are you going to vote? There are some conversations that need to be had. Don't get me wrong. And I know I'm stirring up a whole bunch of stuff right now. I know it. I know it. I know it. But it's already being stirred up out there. But I'm just trying to bring some, some clarity for in here, if you will, that we are the answer to Jesus' prayer. And you and I don't get there with pride. You and I get there with humility and with empathy and with compassion and with understanding. But unity is messy. And if you want it to be clean and neat and tidy, go to a church where everybody looks like you and believes like you. You can go. God bless you. I'm for you. I want you to flourish. 
I'll see you when Jesus returns and we're all seated, seated at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Because you do know there will be Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector at the same table. Now, maybe you might not want, want to have them at your table. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Unity's messy. But unity with diversity can be heavenly. Now, it's hard, but it can be heavenly. It is, it is miraculous what God has done with Shoreline City. It's miraculous. And we have not arrived at all. And if you expect us to have arrived and have gotten everything right at every turn, we're not going to. I'll, I'll repent when I need to repent and say sorry where I need to say sorry. I don't have any political agenda here. I've got a kingdom agenda here. I've got a kingdom agenda. Matter of fact, people don't even know what to do with me. Like, you're black, so you must be a Democrat, but you're Christian, so you must be a Republican. And I'm like, I'm neither. I'm a theocrat. I am saying Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is my Lord and Savior. I'm going to vote. You should too. But I'm telling you, I'm not looking for policies to be the thing that makes it on earth as it is in heaven. I'm looking for the church to be the ones that make it on earth as it is in heaven. Last principle here. Then I'm going to read my last couple of verses and we're done. Hopefully you can still hear me. What happens in your heart, listen to this, what happens in your heart has everything to do with what you allow into your head and what comes out of your mouth. So if you are finding your heart is building up disdain for those who Jesus has asked to sit at the table with you, you have to ask yourself, what is, what am I allowing to come into my head and what is coming out of my mouth? And if you keep saying a whole bunch of they, 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 they at your dinner table, do not be surprised when a they knocks on your door or a they is someone your spouse wants to marry. Not your spouse, your son or daughter wants to marry. I pray your spouse does it. I pray you stay with your same spouse in the name of Jesus. <laughs> or your son or daughter wants to play with that school. Because God has a way of messing with those days in our life. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm all done here. I'm all done, okay? I'm all done. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Back to John 17, verses 20 and 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. I in them and you in me so that they, they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is the mandate for the church. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as he conforms us to the image of Christ, not to the image 
of the world that we live in. Father, I pray over our church family, every man and woman, every person who's under the sound of my voice, those of us who are frustrated right now and those who are confused right now. I pray for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding to guard our heart and our minds. And I come against every demonic force that would try to distort and to bring division into your house. Father, I pray that you would kill every spirit of pride and envy. You would kill every religious spirit. I pray, Father, that we would be a people that would be on our knees, surrendered to you, and we give you permission to change us from the inside out. We're asking that our eyes would be opened to see not only what you are doing, but what you want to do on the inside of us and what you want to do through us. And we pray that the world would be able to look at our lives and they would know that, Jesus, you have been sent by God and that you love us just like you love your son. And may that love shatter every surface level or deep rooted division that we have. And may your church be a light in this generation. Father, we are asking that you help us. We are asking that you push us forward. We are asking that you empower us by your spirit. If you're under the sound of my voice, you've never given your heart and your life to Christ. You never made him first. You've never made him number one. But you're saying, I don't want to go my own way anymore. I want to go his way. I don't want to be first. I want him to be first in my life. I'm not asking, do you want to join a church per se? I'm asking, do you want to surrender your life to Jesus and not the Jesus of culture, the Jesus that we saw get on an old rugged cross, get put in a tomb, be raised from the dead on a third day and say, whosoever can come unto me will be saved. That Jesus has his arms open wide to every single one of us today. And if you're ready to surrender your heart and your life to him, I want you to know it's his grace that even brought you to that moment. I want you to put your hand over your heart if you would not mind. And I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I admit I've made mistakes. And today I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This is a moment of salvation for you, a moment of a brand new start. Dare I say it's a moment even for our church, a brand new start and a fresh beginning. Hey, I'm really, really honored that you spent this time with us today. If you have any prayer requests at all, we want to know about it. Text SC Connect to 97,000. And I also want to continue to remind all of us, let's keep putting God first in our giving. Let's keep being ridiculously generous. Let's get this message all over the world so that the world may believe that Jesus was sent. And we've all been loved by God just like Jesus is loved by God. So go ahead, keep on being generous, church family, and let's make it on earth as it is in heaven. I'm really glad that we have this time together today. Some time for us to, to pray together, some time to, to, to chat together, some time to be maybe a little bit uncomfortable, maybe push forward in our faith. I pray that everything I said that was from God would stick and everything that I said that was not of God would fall by the wayside. I'm not trying to puff myself up. I just want Jesus to be lifted up. And as he is, as I said, he's going to draw men and women unto himself. But this is the spirit of our church and the spirit of how we're moving forward. And I'm believing for an absolute revival to take place. There's a difference between revival and awakening, I've heard. A, a revival is particular to the church. An awakening is something that happens outside of the church walls. An awakening is what God just kind of, he does sovereignly and it begins to happen all around the globe or, or in different pockets of society. But a revival happens in the church where people who have been maybe lulled to sleep for whatever reason or have, or have drinking the, uh, who, have, who have decided to drink from the cup of the world and have allowed the world to be the thing that dictates
dictates uh, their love for others. A revival happens when, when God says, hey, church, get back to your first love. Get back to how I designed you. Get back to what your focus ought to be. Get back to who I designed and fashioned you to be. A revival is what we need in the church. We don't need more politics in the church. We need more prayer in the church. We need more people that are willing to lay down their lives and say, God, you can have all of me. That's what we need in the church. We need some people to be willing to say, you know what? I love you despite some foolishness that I think you have in your head right now. I love you. I love you. I love. It hurts, but I love you. It bothers me, but I love you. I, I, I'm, I'm crying tears, but I love you. But there's space at the table for zealots and for tax collectors. The space at the table. This is good news. Because I need some space at the table. And so don't you. So we're going to sing this next song. We're asking for the God of revival to do what only the God of revival can do. And to ignite his church. Open up our eyes. Tear down strongholds. And for us to see Jesus lifted up and it to be on earth as it is in heaven.